thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Scott Abramson. I'm a historian of the modern Middle East and a lecturer in the Nazarian Center. More to the point, though, I'm the moderator of this panel, Israeli Diplomacy in the Middle East and North Africa, Past, Present, and Future. Um, on this panel, there sit five distinguished students of modern Israel and the modern Middle East. Uh, it's nice to deal with the issue of diplomacy, which is a welcome and refreshing relief uh, from conflict in the world's most war-torn region. Um, and so uh, let us begin with um, Jake uh, Rosenfeld, he, who is a native of uh, Dallas and a graduate of the University of Kansas, <clears throat> where he double majored in international studies and Jewish studies. He intends to move to Israel this fall with a view to pursuing a career in international relations. His paper is titled Cold Peace versus Warm Peace, the Abraham Accords compared to previous Arab-Israeli treaties. Jake, the floor is yours. Well, my name is Jake Rosenfield, um, and today I'm gonna to be presenting my spring 2021 research project, uh, Warm Peace versus Cold Peace, the Abraham Accords and previous peace treaties. And first I wanna provide a kind of a general overview of, excuse me, a general overview of the surrounding history and context of the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty and the 2020 Abraham Accords. Um, then I'll explain my methods and data as well as explaining how uh, my research fits into the existing literature um, and lastly, I'll provide some, some key points uh, in summary. Um, so for my research project, I examined the primary differences between the 2020 Abraham Accords and the uh, 1994 Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty. Um, the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty was, was signed on October 26, 1994 between Israel and Jordan. Um, and it ended a 46 year state of war uh, between Israel and Jordan, decades of on and off armed conflict. Um, on the other hand, you have the Abraham Accords, which was agreed upon, I don't know why I said that, agreed upon um, August 13th, 2020, signed in Washington, D.C. a year later, uh, a month later, excuse me, uh, between the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, the United States, and Israel. And it's very important to note that um, the Abraham Accords was a, a very monumental moment for Israeli-Arab relations, not only for Israeli-Arab relations, but it was a big moment um, in modern Middle Eastern history. Um, it was just the first time that uh, really a public normalization of relations between Israel um, and an Arab country since that of the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty. Um, so my research question is, in what ways does the 2020 Abraham Accords differ from the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty. And in order to answer that, I utilized uh, in-depth text analysis of the relevant primary sources, uh, which make up of the 2020 Abraham Accords uh, Agreement and the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty. Um, I also use keyword coding to analyze the treaties and their positions on, on specific sectors, such as security, uh, water rights, the Palestinian refugee crisis, tourism, technology, uh, investment. As far as my literature for you, some of the literature that I found pertaining to the Abraham Accords focused on the potential and uh, the future of the Abraham Accords. Or on the other hand, uh, the literature I found pertaining to the, to the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty focused on the lack of development of, of relations between Israel and Jordan following the signing of the Peace Treaty. Um, and, and many scholars use the term cold peace when describing uh, the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty. For example, David Schenker in 2014 states that it's been very unpopular among the Jordanian public. Um, furthermore, Sharon and Ben Khalifa focus on the challenges stemming from the Israel Jordan Peace Treaty, uh, mainly focusing on the Palestinian refugee crisis and water scarcity in the region. Um, 
It's a win win in terms of establishing peace, says Ron, but uh, in terms of establishing development and relations between Israel and Jordan, it's seen as a failure. Um, and as far as the Abraham Accords, uh, Lakuta says that it's, it's, it's very difficult to compare the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty, um, considering the existing circumstances at the time of the agreement. Um, it's very important to keep in mind that uh, the Abraham Accords was, was not an example of, of US intervention following several rounds of armed conflict. Um, instead, it was, it was two close allies of the United States coming together, uh, putting the old Arab-Israeli dispute in the back mirror um, in, in hopes of lasting peace and endless possibilities for development of several different sectors and industries in both countries. Um, as for my research findings, I, I initially noticed that uh, the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty is, is much more complex compared to the 2020 Abraham Accords. Um, and this really wasn't a surprise to me, considering that Israel and Jordan are neighboring countries who share borders, uh, bodies of water. Um, and also, it's important to note that the 1994 peace treaty uh, was a true peace treaty, um, which, which main aim was to end armed conflict, uh, whereas the Abraham Accords is, is more of a normalization of relations. Um, so, the Israel Jordan Peace Treaty contains 30 separate articles. Um, and some of the more important ones are the establishment of peace, the establishment of international boundaries, security, water, economic relations, refugees and displaced persons, and uh, tourism. So Article 3 deals with the establishment of international boundaries. Um, the boundaries consist of, of somewhat natural, natural borders uh, defined by the Red Sea in the south, uh, the Dead Sea, and um, the Jordan River up in the north. There are four different uh, border crossings, the Adam Crossing, the King Hussein Crossing north of the Dead Sea, um, and the Rabin Crossing just north of the Big Lake. Um, Article 4 of the Israel Jordan Peace Treaty talks about security, preserving peace, and preventing terrorism. And this is perhaps the most uh, successful part of the treaty is security. Uh, regarding regional developments and, and security threats, both Israel and Jordan cooperate uh, with each other and share intelligence. However, you know, due to cold peace, a majority of, of this cooperation is, is done out of the public eye uh, covertly um, due to the majority and public's disapproval of the treaty. Um, Article six pertains to water agreements considering both Israel and Jordan face water shortages and share a Jordan River as a border. Uh, water was a, was a very key component of the treaty. Um, and a more recent development happened in 2013. Um, the Red Dead Canal project was agreed upon by Israel and Jordan in order to address potential water shortages. They agreed to uh, water swaps, um, as well as the construction of desalination plants um, for the Red Sea. Um, and a desalinization plant for the Dead Sea as well. Um, Article 8 deals with refugees and displaced persons. Um, considering the ongoing Palestinian refugee crisis, this was also a major component of the 1994 peace treaty. Um, however, it's, it's really important to note that the 94 peace treaty doesn't really have a, a solution to the Palestinian refugee crisis. Um, instead, it states that um, recognizing, you know, the human problems caused by conflict in the mi Middle East, that uh, these issues cannot be fully resolved on, uh, on the bilateral level between Israel and Jordan. Instead, parties will have to uh, resolve them in the appropriate forums in accordance with, with international law. Uh, moving on, the Israel-UAE peace treaty, on the other hand, is composed of, of 12 different sections. Some of the more important ones are the establishment of peace, diplomatic relations and normalization, um, the establishment of embassies, and we've seen this as embassies have opened up in Israel, as well as the UAE. Um, cooperation and agreements in other spheres, such as civil aviation, um, innovation and trade, scientific technology, tourism, energy, and water, um, and seven, a strategic agenda for the Middle East. Um, both of these countries are, are allies of the United States, 
And both of these countries view uh, the growing Iranian influence in the region as a significant security threat. Um, so this is another reason as to why the UAE saw that it was a good time to uh, normalize relations with Israel. Um, it's also important to note that the mention of Palestine or the Palestinian refugee crisis um, goes on fairly unmentioned in, in the Israel-UAE peace treaty. Um, it, it just says refer to the 2020 Trump vision for peace. Um, so in conclusion, you know, there's, there's very few similarities between the 1994 Israel Jordan Peace Treaty and the 2020 Abraham Accords. Um, you have to keep in mind the, the necessity of, of the 1994 Israel Jordan Treaty was prioritized due to decades of military conflict and violence. Um, on the other hand, Israel and the UAE, although they had no formal relations, uh, you know, they were not in direct conflict with one another. Um, and so due to this, you know, historical context, the, the natural diction of, of these two treaties is, is going to be different. Um, for example, the 1994 Israel Jordan Treaty focuses on um, the creation of peace, preservation of peace, borders, water, and uh, Palestinian refugees. There's really not an emphasis on economic development or people to people ties. And this is why many scholars today use the term cold peace. Uh, when describing the Israel Jordan Peace Treaty. On the other hand, uh, you have the 2020 Abraham Accords, which primarily focuses on the opposite um, and emphasizes economic development, uh, technology, and tourism. Um, and this, this shows the possibility of, of warm peace is, is far greater uh, when economies of two countries intermingle. People with people ties have an opportunity to uh, work their way up from the ground up. Um, and so this is why many scholars believe that the possibility of warm peace between Israel and the UAE is more likely to occur. However, um, we're still in the first year uh, since agreeing to the Abraham Accords. So ultimately time will tell. Um, so that wraps up my presentation. I wanna thank you all for your time and uh, thanks again. Thank you, Jake. Okay, um, let me now summon to the virtual podium, uh, Sabrina Barre. Uh, she is a third year student at uh, Sciences Po Paris and an exchange student at UCLA. Uh, she's a political science major, a Middle Eastern studies minor, and uh, most significant, a two-time former student of mine. Okay, thanks. So thanks, Professor Abramson, for introducing me. Um, so in fact, my name is Sabrina and I'll be presenting my topic on the discrete relationship as a means of nation building from 1948 to the year 2000 between two specific countries, which are Israel and Morocco. Hmm. Um, so first I'll provide a, a general historical timeline, which was the basis of my work. And I'll explain a bit and introduce the presentation. Uh, I'll then explain the main findings of my work uh, in three different sections followed by um, two specific examples that truly showcase the political and military success of this, this uh, discrete cooperation between Israel and Morocco. Uh, and eventually I'll just go over my key findings and I'll offer some thoughts on uh, future research. Uh, so I'd just like to start my presentation with uh, Morocco's recent rapprochement with Israel in the light of the recent Abraham Accords. So um, while for the UAE, Sudan and Bahrain, this was uh, in fact the, the, the introducing of a new relationships between these countries in Israel. But for Morocco, this was just the continuation and the renewal of an old relationship, which I'll be, uh, which I'll be uh, uh, explaining uh, throughout this presentation. So, and I'll be explaining how Israel and Morocco maintains a half a century long relationship that even though it was secret, brought significant benefit uh, to both parties. Um, so the spotlight will particularly be on the Moroccan diplomacy and how uh, towards Israel and how Israel responded to, uh, to Morocco and how both countries relied on each other in order to satisfy uh, personal goals. So I'll just, uh, just to get everything, to get things straight, I'll start from 1948, so creation of Israel, uh, all the way to, to the year 2000, which marks the end of the official diplomatic relations between the two countries. So we'll just go over two main, uh, we'll, we'll talk about Morocco under two monarchies, so Mohammed V and King Hassan II. So just a quick start, uh, I'd like to say that as a French Moroccan student living in France, 
uh, and very passionate about Middle Eastern studies. I've always wanted to learn uh, and to know more about how a country I thought I knew, Morocco, uh, got its way, and especially with uh, Israel, which is the case of this conference. So I thought this, this subject were, was worth investigating for a few number of reasons. First of all, there's not much research on the, the relations between Israel and Morocco, probably due to the classified aspect of some information, which takes time to progressively get de declassified. Uh, it was also the opportunity to zoom in on an Arab country with a public private uh, tension uh, in this diplomacy. Uh, I was able to cross uh, sources from all four languages, so it was easy, pretty, pretty easy for English and French, but it did, I did need some help for Arabic and Hebrew, I have to be honest though. Um, and last but not least, I also was able to interview two Moroccan citizens who immigrated to France in the last 20 years. And interestingly, a major part of these findings uh, were actually very surprising to them, and I hope uh, it will be to you too. So I'll pass on to my main findings. So I just cut my paper in three main topics that I want to explain quickly. So first, I want to talk about what brought the two countries together and what really facilitated these relationships. And the first point is uh, their shared positions and their, uh, yeah, on a wide number of issues. So first, there was this shared alignment with the West in the context of the Cold War uh, and, an, and an overall occidentophilia of uh, Israel and Morocco's highest officials. Uh, also, they were pretty isolated in their own regions, as Morocco was on the western periphery of is sorry on the western peri periphery of the Maghreb, and Israel was and is surrounded by enemy Arab states, and they both existed at the time uh, in fear of pan-Arabism and, and um, Islamic terrorism extremism. Sorry, um, and so furthermore, as as Israel was created in 1948, followed shortly by the Mor Mor Morocco's independence in 1956 both states needed to prove themselves uh, as having historical and po strong political and historical identities nonetheless, even though they were pretty recent. Um, and the last point of this, of this section is how Morocco had a unique status among the Arab community regarding Jewish people. This is a super important aspect because in fact, for a few years, Morocco was uh, the North African country with the largest Jewish community, which brought the two countries together and facilitated a natural development of the relations between both countries. Uh, and Jewish immigration thus brings me to my second point, which is how uh, this relationship originated from respective national uh, issues and crisis. So um, to link Jewish immigration, well, as Israel was created, they needed to assert the existence of the state through Zionism, and especially they needed to bring back Moroccans of uh, Jews of the world uh, back to Israel. And this included Moroccan Jews. So this was a very important uh, issue that brought the two countries together. Uh, and as mentioned previously, um, the regional inferiority, of course, of uh, Israel in regards to surrounding Arab states, so Jordan, Syria, Egypt, uh, pushed uh, the country to need to rely on an inside man. And as for Morocco, well, um, there, was, there were regional tensions and uh, insecurity regarding the frontiers with Algeria, especially. Uh, following the end of the French protectorate, there was uh, a clear lack of, uh, of military structure uh, among the Moroccan armed forces, uh, where Israel had uh, a bit of a role. Um, and eventually, there was also a rising, uh, under um, King Hassan II's um, reign, there were rising political opposition groups, uh, such as especially the UNFP, so the Popular Union, the National Union of Popular Forces, so Union Nationale des Forces Populaires. Uh, which demanded the departure of the foreign forces that were still in, in Morocco under the king's approval, and especially who supported the Algerian insurrection. So this section just shows to just goes to show how Morocco, in its approach to Israel and to Jews, was really unique in the region. So now the real question is why was secrecy so important for this partner partnership to actually develop? Well, first, uh, first of all, King Hassan II uh, really took on the role of mediator very quickly in the region. Uh, and the fact that this relationship was secret allowed them more room for maneuver. So who we call Morocco's messenger of peace had a major pivotal role uh, between the Arab states and Israel and even the world actually. So the, on the one hand, the public facade uh, facilitated negotiations with the Arab states uh, and also reduce the risk of popular uprisings since uh, Moroc the Moroccan population is and was mainly pro-Palestinian, uh, coupled with the historical anti-Semitism. Uh, 
And on the other hand, this uh, allowed Morocco to, uh, allowed the king to develop uh, specific ties with Israel to uphold its national interests. And to illustrate these three main findings, I'll just take uh, two specific examples um, that, uh, so that uh, so, uh, two specific gains of uh, this discrete relationship between Israel and Morocco. Start, so starting with Morocco. So during the sand wars, which I think is a really important example, it, which really shows this, the, the strength of this uh, relationship. During the sand wars of October, 1963, the former Mossad chief, Ephraim Halevi, reported that the Mossad leader at the time, Meir Amit, with a false passport, met in Marrakesh with King Hassan II. So the Israeli army instructors um, trained Moroccan officers, the aviators, they sold weapons to Morocco uh, via Tehran especially, and they also supervised the construction of a barrier between Algeria and Morocco. Because this, the, yeah, for con context, the, the sand war was a, a conflict between Algeria and Morocco. So uh, it just goes to show that uh, maybe, uh, who knows, maybe without this Israeli uh, support, military support, maybe Morocco wouldn't have won uh, militarily this war. And as for Israel, um, there's a very intriguing example which needs to be taken uh, with, uh, which is allegedly from a different a number of sources, but we need to take a step back while taking a look at this example. So the Secret Arab League Summit uh, in 1965 King Hassan II allegedly, uh, according to my sources, al uh, allowed the Mossad and Shin Bet agents to bug the meeting while by giving them access to an entire floor of the Casablanca Hotel where the meeting took place. And allegedly, the information withdrawn uh, may have played a, a significant role uh, in the in the beginning of uh, the Six Day War by uh, by the invasion of Egyptian airfields by Israel. Uh, well, in fact, the recordings revealed uh, that the Arab elites were divided and also that uh, if a war was, were to happen, they weren't ready to confront Israel anyway. So this piece of information coupled with, of course, uh, other forms of intelligence uh, led the Israeli, could allegedly have led the Israeli army to bomb uh, Egyptian airfields. So finally, the question is, how did this partnership fail since uh, we've seen a lot of successes uh, uh, throughout this presentation. Well, in 1999, when uh, King Hassan II died, in, as he was the main contributor of this, uh, this alliance, his death really took a toll on the relationship between both countries. And eventually, the second Intifada in the year 2000 uh, led Mohammed Fab and his government, the, so the following, Mohammed VI, sorry, so his son, sorry, uh, led him and his government to um, close the, both liaison offices and it really rang the death knell of this uh, of the two countries' relationships. So, as a conclusion, I'll just summarize my my point in a sentence uh, by summarizing my main findings. Uh, so, this was so my topic just presented how a mutually beneficial relationship between Israel and Morocco was able, thanks to a unique regional shared common ground, uh, respective uh, national issues on both sides, which required absolute secrecy to be resolved. And so looking back at these relationships, we can now look forward and especially uh, it, it actually helps us better understand um, the signing of the Israeli Morocco uh, normalization agreement of December 2020, so very not long ago, in exchange of the official American recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western, the Western Sahara territory. So it's not a trivial matter as we've seen uh, in this presentation, and I think uh, personally that it really showcases uh, the supremacy of self-interest for a nation's leader over any other concern. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Okay, let me now introduce uh, Kane Carlisle who is a recent graduate in history from Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, in September, he'll embark on graduate study, uh, pursuing a master's in history at the University of Manchester. There we go. Okay, so my presentation is called A Stable Rock About Which the Waves of the Region Swirl, the Regional History of the Middle East and North Africa from 1978 and its influence on the Israel-Egyptian US peace talks. So this is specifically going to be looking at four key events that happened during the 
during these talks, and these are going to be the Iranian Revolution, the siege of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and the moving of uh, Israel's capital to Jerusalem under the basic law that moved to Jerusalem as it's known. So some context to these negotiations first. Uh, these came about as a result of the Six Day War, which saw uh, a large amount of territorial changes between Israel and its, and its Arab enemies. And these were largely the Sinai Peninsula, the entire West Bank, as well as the Golan Heights. This war started uh, due to a threat to the Tehran Straits being blocked by both Jordan and Egypt. But because of some intelligence that Israel received prior to this, they were able to obliterate the Egyptian air force prior to the war, allowing them to win so quick and successfully. Um, also, six years after this, the Yom Kippur War was started by Egypt to try and regain areas of the Suez Canal. But it was also sort of like a larger cry to help the international community to try and get the, the Sinai Peninsula returned to Egypt. Uh, and so it also gained the attention of countries like the US, who will be the main uh, partner in these negotiations. So this started in 1977 when President Anwar Sadat of Egypt um, had an official visit to Jerusalem, and he was the first Arab leader to do this, which did eventually result in Egypt's isolation from the Arab community. Initially, these talks were only to discuss uh, bilateral issues, particularly the Sinai issue between the two countries. But uh, by mid-1978, these talks had stalled, and so the US was called in to mediate between the two countries. These mediations largely resulted in the Camp David Accords, which were the main success from the negotiations, which saw the return of the Sinai Peninsula and the withdrawal of Israeli settlements from it in return for Egyptian recognition of Israel and uh, normalization of relations between the two countries. But also within this, it created a framework for a wider Arab-Israeli uh, peace settlement, which was basically went out for the next two years, which is what this presentation will discuss. Uh, so moving on to the first event is the Iranian Revolution. So from the outlook to Egypt, Israel and the US, this looked largely like an anti-imperialist and quite left-wing revolution at first because it was actually made up of multiple factions of both left-wing like communists like the Tudor party, but also Islamists such as Ayatollah Khomeini who's pictured at the bottom here. But um, So for instance, with the anti-imperialist message, this Arab banner at the top reads, long live the anti-imperialist and democratic forces. So this sought to actually speed up negotiations initially between Israel and Egypt and getting their peace settlement sorted. But it also allowed Israel to justify an increased settlement drive, uh, largely due to the fact that uh, once Ayatollah Khomeini uh, at the bottom here had taken power over Iran and sort of uh, consolidated the revolution for the Islamist faction, he endorsed um, basically armed Palestinian resistance. And so settlements were used to, uh, to like justify security concerns in Israel. Uh, moving on to the siege of the Grand Mosque. So a bit of context for how this happened. Uh, during the late 1970s, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia had made several efforts towards liberalization, such as the formation of a constitutional committee, which was supposed to come up with a constitution for the state, even though that still hasn't happened today and it's still an absolute monarchy. Uh, right now. But um, these attempts to liberalisation um, alienated quite a lot of the population and led to a group of hardline Wahhabi militants led by a guy called Jahayim and Al-Wutabi to seize the Grand Mosque in Mecca, which is the holiest site of all of Islam. So it's making quite a statement. Um, eventually, this was uh, crushed, this like, this like rebellion was crushed with the help of uh, French commandos who are pictured here on the right, uh, as well as uh, Western weapons. But even though the like the sort of the uprising was crushed, uh, the Saudi state absorbed the ideas of the Wahhabi militants because it was it, it posed a massive threat to their legitimacy and the legit legitimacy of their rule. And so from then on, Saudi Arabia became a lot more hardline uh, Wahhabi, like Islamist state sort of. Um, and you can still see this today with a lot of its anti-Western rhetoric and um, how Saudi Arabia is quite hostile to like, Western troops being based on its soil, which you saw, for instance, in the 1991 Gulf War. And uh, as a result of this more hardline position, they could use their like, vast wealth to get from their like, oil deposits to uh, give aid to countries like Jordan in return that they fall into line uh, on how they feel about the Israeli-Arab negotiations, which in this case, they sort of tried to stall negotiations to gain concessions from Israel, even though it didn't eventually work. 
Moving on to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which was probably one of the biggest turning points in the negotiation process. So first we have to look at this in the Cold War context. So the Soviet invasion sort of uh, confirmed US fears that uh, the Soviets were trying to uh, penetrate influence into the region. And so the US tried to consolidate its gains by ensuring Egypt was firmly in like, the Western camp. And they did this by lavishing vast economic and military aid on Egypt, which as you can see from around 1979 and 1980, increased massively and has, has been quite high ever since. Um, Israel also again used this to justify uh, the creation of more settlements because of the like, growing insecurity of the region. And this increased settlement drive led to UN Security Council Resolution 465, which said that the settlements constituted a serious obstruction to achieving a comprehensive, just and lasting peace. And this, this is still largely a massive issue today with almost the entire international community, with the exception of the US perhaps seeing the settlements as um, illegal and the controversial manner of uh, the settlements can be seen with this picture where you've got Israeli guards at the entrance to one of the settlements. And finally, moving on to the Jerusalem war. So this first affected uh, Arab-Israeli uh, peace negotiations when the bill was first debated in the Israeli Knesset when uh, Sadat basically, once he'd learned of the bill, he pulled out his negotiators from the negotiations, sort of again to try and like a stalling tactic to try and gain concessions from Israel and Palestinian autonomy, uh, even though again, this didn't particularly work. But more importantly, the biggest effect uh, this Jerusalem law had was um, the condemnate of, re received the condemnation from uh, the UN with UN Security Council Resolution 478, which essentially was quite, um, it's got like a firebrand move that called for the moving of all uh, foreign embassies out of the whole city of Jerusalem and to Tel Aviv, where most of them are located nowadays, except for America, who recently moved it back to Israel in 2017 under President Trump. Um, the US actually abstained from uh, this like, this uh, Security Council vote, even though it wasn't a, um, a direct endorsement of it. It was sort of like a tacit approval that, that they disagreed with Israel's decision to do this. And as you can see, here, um, it, it quite angered uh, the Israeli ambassador, Ephraim Evron, who said that it was an abuse of Security Council power. Um, and then finally, uh, in November 1980, President Ronald Reagan was elected as US president, basically making the last few months of Jimmy Carter's presidency a lame duck presidency, where he couldn't particularly do too much for the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict. And then once Reagan was inaugurated as president, he gave a lot less focus to the Israeli-Palestinian-Arab issue and still focused a lot more on uh, basically the Soviets and fighting the Cold War. And so the main takeaways from this are that the Iranian revolution gave rise to security, security concerns over the Soviet regional incursion and that the possibility of an Islamist resistance emerging uh, to our Palestinian peace allowed Israel, Israel to expand its settlement program, which complicated talks for West Bank autonomy, which wasn't really addressed until the Oslo Accords between 1993 and 1995 with the establishment of the Palestinian Authority. Um, Saudi Arabia became more anti-Western in its outlook, which it still largely stays that way today, uh, and complicated negotiations by utilizing its economic aid on smaller states to stall negotiations. Uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan led to small gains in the Cold War context, such as Egypt being gained as a, a, a strong firm US ally, it's probably the second biggest U, uh, U, US ally in the Middle East, even today. Um, and they also act as a justification for an intensive Israeli settlement campaign due to the growing instability of the region. And finally, the Jerusalem law led to stone negotiations from the Arab side with the withdrawal of their negotiators. Um, but it also resulted in a general loss of support for the Camp David Accords framework from both the UN and just the, the wider general communities. So for instance, at this time, uh, the EC states uh, started developing their own framework for an Arab-Israeli settlement, even though this eventually didn't go anywhere. And yeah, there we go. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. Okay, I'd like to invite uh, David Monshnikov uh, to um, give his uh, presentation on the history of um, Saudi-Israeli relations. Uh, David is a graduate of uh, Sonoma State University, and uh, he tells me he uh, is a father, a motorcycle enthusiast, and a seeker of a job, uh, preferably one concerned with Israel. 
Uh, hello. Good good morning. Um, instead of slides, I anytime I do slides, they come out terrible. So what I did is uh, I made just a, a special Zoom background that um, isn't for some reason. Oh, there it goes. Should theoretically come up here behind me, please. Please work. There we go. Okay. So we're going to go that way with it. Uh, hello, my name is David Muchnikoff, and I'm here today to talk about the importance of establishing formal dip diplomatic relations and public relationships between Israel and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I'm grateful and humbled to be here today, and I've really enjoyed listening to all of your presentations, and I've learned a lot today. Uh, I first wrote this paper about two years ago, uh, back in the late spring of 2019, and at the time, the diplomatic landscape of the Middle East looked considerably different. A lot of things have changed and evolved since then. Uh, before the Abraham Accords, formal relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia felt like a diplomatic moonshot, almost impossible. I, re I rewrote and reworked my paper and handed it in a few hours before the deadline on the 4th. As is the nature of the Middle East, even since the 4th, there have been some significant developments that make my paper feel even more old and outdated not unlike myself as a 46 year old college student. I also noticed when I reread my paper earlier that I seem to have deleted a couple important sections. For example, most of the history of the Israeli Saudi relationship was gone. So that's fun too. Also always good to leave out super important stuff when you're trying to make a point. Uh, we all know as of Sunday, Israel has a new government and it remains to be seen what will be the foreign policy priorities for the new governing coalition. I can really only speculate, hope, and make suggestions to my wife and dogs about what I think should happen. I will say that if the recently sworn in government were able to find a way to officialize normalization with the Saudis, it would certainly cement their place in history as well as be a great example of their effectiveness. Um, it'd be quite a diplomatic victory and could serve as a unifying factor between rival factions uh, if put to a vote in the Knesset, I feel like that would be something that everybody could theoretically agree on. One of those rare things. Uh, one of the things that remains the same is the difficulty of writing about a relationship that mainly exists in shadows and whispers. When it comes to citing things in the proper academic fashion, it's pretty tough going. At times, I feel like a Bigfoot researcher dependent on reported sightings and blurry photos. Without access to people and documents far out of my reach, I'm left with a trail of breadcrumbs that is the Internet. Sometimes the story is as much about what isn't said as what is said and reading between the lines and working in the negative spaces. Um, let's see. Uh, the presentation tips guide mentioned that we should concentrate on big takeaways idea-wise, the concepts that stand out and such. With this in mind, I'd like to borrow a page from a well-known scholar, David Letterman, and offer a top 10 list of the most important pieces of this relationship pretend, uh, presented in no particular order. Number one, on human rights. Like I mentioned in my paper, for me personally, as an individual, as a human being, and as a politically progressive Californian, there's a lot of things that make me uncomfortable, um, and some of which are just straight up offensive. Uh, I tried to write from a realist, best worst option perspective, compartmentalizing my personal values to aim for broader perspective and for the greater good. I also wrote from the perspective of putting Israel's long-term security and stability ahead of all else. In other words, I got in character. It's a tricky time right now with Israel's image in the West, particularly in the US at kind of a low point with public perception focused on human rights issues, some of which are clever marketing by Hamas and friends, some of which are absolutely valid. Uh, some could certainly argue that now isn't the best time to solidify a partnership with a regime that has optics issues in regards to human rights. Uh, Western and American public perception of Saudi Arabia is also at a low point following the assassination of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Personally, I find this to be a reprehensible act. Getting into character, however, I would argue that the disappearance of a troublesome journalist by state actors or those aspiring to be state actors is a pretty common occurrence, sadly. According to the nonprofit Committee to Protect Journalists, between 2009 and 2019, 318 journalists were killed to silence their work worldwide. Furthermore, 86% of those murders have gone unprosecuted. Of these, the Saudis committed one, allegedly. 
comparatively in that same time period, Brazil has averaged five to 10 murder journalists a year, Russia 10 to 15, Mexico 15 to 20, and the Philippines between 40 and 50. Out of those 318, most of us have only heard about the one and likely at least 318 times. Number two of the unique things about the relationship between Israel and the KSA is that, it, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that sentence makes no sense there. Uh, it has historically been driven more often by the shared enemies of the two countries than by their shared friends. In the early 60s, shared opposition to Nasser led to quiet cooperation in Yemen. Today, the main shared th enemy driving Israeli-Saudi cooperation is Iran. Both Israel and the Saudis oppose the Iran nuclear deal and both praise the U.S.'s departure from it under Trump. The relationship between the KSA and the post-1979 Iranian regime has been rocky over the years with on-again, off-again diplomatic relations. Recently, there have been attempts at dialogue and possible rapprochement between the two in Iraqi brokered peace talks. In this way, I think it puts pressure on Israel to strike while the iron is hot in regards to using shared opposition to Iran as a unifying factor. If Iran and the KSA come to a separate agreement, much of the urgency and need for cooperation might wane in the Saudis' eyes, which is good for the KSA, good for Iran, terrible for Israel, and maybe concerning for the U.S. Uh, number three, in Saudi Arabia, only 6% of the population supports normalization with Israel, um, at least when they're talking to a foreign pollster. Uh, any normalization would take place without a mandate from the people. For perspective, in Egypt, only about 15% of people support uh, relations with Israel, even after 40 years after the peace agreement. Words came out backwards there, sorry. Number four, one of the risks of a potential relationship between Israel and the KSA would be a scenario similar to Iran. Israel's support for and close relationship with the Shah were noted and have been vividly remembered by those that replaced him. If and when there were ever a similar upheaval or regime change in Saudi Arabia, that would have lingering repercussions and we'd be right back where we started, if not worse off. Number five, oil. Energy security for the future. More than 95% of Israel's oil imports come from Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan via pipeline through Turkey. It would be nice to have options that are less dependent on Erdogan and Turkey's whims uh, in the long term. The Saudis also share tension with the Erdogan regime. Number six, the islands of Sanafir and Tehran in the Tehran Strait. Egypt transferred ownership of these islands to Saudi Arabia in 2016. This creates a bit of an anomaly or a diplomatic salient is something I came up to describe it. Um, since Egypt has a formal agreement with Israel and the KSA does not. Israeli access to the Red Sea is guaranteed by treaty, and the proposed bridge from the KSA to Egypt will need to be designed in a way that doesn't prevent navigation. Uh, number seven, BB and MBS had their first public confirmed meeting this past November. They met in uh, Neom, Saudi Arabia, and then Secretary of State Pompeo was also there, although Saudi Arabia officially denied that this happened. Uh, number eight, Neom. Is, uh, Neom is a project city in far northwestern Saudi Arabia near the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, Neom is intended to be a futuristic, clean and green city and technology center. It's one of the centerpieces of uh, MBS's Vision 2030, which kind of uh, lays out the map for modernization and the future of Saudi Arabia. Uh, number nine is a project that I actually hadn't heard about called the Tracks for Regional Peace, which uh, involves building an Israel, uh, a railroad from Oman all the way uh, to Israel and even to Egypt that would connect all of the Gulf states uh, to Israel financially and I guess physically we would call that. Um, and let's see, number 10. Since, at least on paper, Palestinian statehood is the price of admission for normalization with Saudi Arabia, perhaps the Saudis can, could, would, and should help put pressure on the Palestinian Authority to negotiate and or they could express more publicly their disdain, dissatisfaction, and uh, just general dislike for Hamas and the PIJ and those type folks. Um, Future research wise, I'm hoping to someday be able to go outside uh, 
Um, after that, a trip to the library would be nice. And beyond that, it would be really nice to be able to go to Israel and to Saudi Arabia. I've never been to either and have always desperately wanted to go to both. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to just go study more in person in the places that I'm reading about, I guess. And that's all. Thank you, David. Okay. Uh, now I'd like to invite again to the digital podium, uh, Natalia Orendia Tregilis, uh, who will be presenting her paper on um, the polarization, online polarization on social media um, between the partisans and detractors of uh, Israel and Palestine. Natalia is a third year global studies major at UCLA and a Spanish and Korean minor. She's uh, an intern at the Berkel Center here at UCLA and a research intern at um, uh, UCLA Center for Middle Eastern Studies. She aspires to a career in international relations or conflict resolution. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. I just want to start off by saying um, good morning and thank you to everyone who has come and participated. Also, congratulations to the students who have gone before me. Um, your presentations have been fantastic and I'm really excited to ask you guys questions in the Q&A following my presentation. As Dr. Abramson has mentioned, my name is Natalia and I'm going to be presenting today on a paper that I wrote for a class that I recently took on the conflict over Israel-Palestine. And specifically, this paper is going to be focusing on the recent violence between Israel and Palestine slash Hamas. Um, and the role that social media plays in, or played in this conflict. Um, but I want to have two quick disclaimers. First of all, um, as I just did, I might be referencing um, the recent violence as being between Israel and Palestine slash Hamas, but in no way do I mean to um, say that the two last actors are the same. I just want to acknowledge um, both parties in their role in um, the Palestinian narrative in this violence. And then second of all, I wanted to express my sincerest condolences to anyone who has been affected by this violence in any way. I know that um, horrifying and graphic images seemed quite unescapable in social media during this violence, but I tried to limit the amount of graphic images or images that I thought too sensitive um, in this presentation. And with that, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to very briefly give a summary of the recent violence between the two actors, then talk about social media's role or social media's perceived role in violence, talk about activists' role in the violence, then I'm going to present my research topic, methodology, findings, and then quickly talk about um, the role that activists can play in the future of this conflict, and then summarize three main takeaways that I hope you all glean from this um, presentation. Very quickly, I just wanted to talk about the recent violence. It spanned um, across the timeline of about a month and a half, with in the beginning having rising tensions and attacks between Israeli and Palestinian actors in, as you see here, April to early May. Then you see those clashes become more serious in um, May 6th and 7th with um, actors and having clashes. And specifically, this is when um, the conflict began to really pick up on social media and other news sources as well. Then you have Hamas and the Israeli government getting involved with rockets and um, creating lots of destruction, leading to the loss of many Palestinian lives and many Israeli lives as well. You have a couple of events that I've listed here, which were um, specifically highlighted in the news. And then finally, on May 20th, you have a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, which was then implemented on May 21st, which there were still skirmishes afterwards, but it largely uh, led to the end of the hostilities between the two parties. And so social media has played a very significant role in this conflict at large in the past couple of years, especially with the rise of technology. But there's a specific role which the public perceives to have about social media. I know that actually in this conference, people were referencing that social media serves to polarize the two sides. And that's what I found when I was looking at the discourse that many people were talking about when um, discussing the role that social media played specifically in this most recent violence. Um, and specifically through these two things that I reference right here, through the spread of images of violence, which serve to um, prompt violence in real life and also clashes online. And then also by not facilitating communication and conversations between opposing sides, creating echo chambers as we like to call them in American discourse about polarization. So through these two things, 
the public perceives social media as a force which polarizes um, the two factors, especially in this most recent violence. And here are some images of the violence, for example, that people um, posted on social media, which people claim to be polarizing. The uh, image on the left is specifically one which is attributed to being the beginning of the violence, which is a video of a Palestinian youth um, slapping an Orthodox Jewish man on the subway. And then here is a reference to those echo chambers that I was talking about, where if you were um, paying attention or if you were involved in um, the violence, you would have seen this image where it's the same image, but two very different narratives about this image. Um, so that's, like I said, reflecting the echo chambers that people talk about on social media. But a lot of the discourse about the social media does not reference the specific actors in promoting this um, content. So I wanted to focus a little bit more on the specific actors and what they were promoting. But one of the main actors that I found were activists. And even for my friends who knew very little about this conflict prior to the violence, we're looking to activists specifically for information on the conflict and also resources on where to help and who to help. I think that actors are, or activists are a specifically important actor in conflicts, especially on social media, because of the four points that I have listed here, which is that they provide information, they serve as a platform for a specific narrative, so they're inherently biased, um, and that they also organize communities, and like I said before, provide resources and explanations for how to help. So they kind of combine the rule that a lot of different platforms have, like for example, news or nonprofits, they kind of combine all of those to present a really unparalleled experience on social media, specifically during conflicts like the most recent violence. So in my research, I wanted to focus on um, activist accounts, their discourse and their engagement on Instagram and whether that served to polarize actors um, in the most recent violence. Specifically, I, um, know that there's does not a lot exist a lot of literature specifically about activist accounts um, during during conflicts and not a lot of literature either on the role which Instagram specifically as a platform plays. A lot of literature on social media and conflict will focus on Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp, but not so much Instagram and like I said before, activist accounts. And then I wanted to quickly answer the question about what this says about the role which so which activist accounts can play in the future of this conflict. Quickly on methodologies, I took the top four Israeli and top four Palestinian accounts. And here is an example of some of the accounts that I used. And then I looked at the posts that they um, posted during the violence and also the engagement with these posts. And just as a, another quick disclaimer, I took these, I took this data from May 25th and May 26th. So the numbers that I have for likes and followers and things like that are just gonna reflect the numbers that were accurate on those days. So if you look at those numbers now, they might be different. Um, and specifically for my research, I focused on the discourse and then the engagement with that discourse. So what are they saying? And, um, like I said, serves to polarize these populations and then the engagement. So are people engaging with that type of rhetoric, with that type of content in order to um, kind of talk about the discourse and what social media or these activist accounts what their role was in this violence. So specifically for discourse, I found that while violence and other polarizing content did make up a large majority or a large portion of their discourse, it was by no means the only thing that these activist accounts were promoting. For example, you can see that information which constitu constitutes about 20% of each discourse um, is a category which focuses largely on educational content and promoting resources and peaceful advocacy. Um, I have a, another version of this presentation which has specific posts that I wanted to show, but it, I didn't have enough time. But information serves as not kind of a combat to violence because it provides a peaceful and productive outlet for communities to advocate for their beliefs and um, combine or uh, kind of come together in a way that is not violent. And then another example is solidarity, which is a category which allows um, allows actors to uh, empower their sides and instill hope in their communities without specifically demonizing a specific side and without, um, without promoting polarizing narratives. So this shows again that while violence and some polarizing content was prevalent, it was by no means the only thing that um, these accounts were talking about.
Furthermore, then I talked about the engagement, like I said, which I uh, quantified with followers. And then as you can see here, engagement with viral posts. So which posts went viral and then also which accounts were people most interested in? And what I found was that people were not in, as interested in accounts and posts which um, focused solely on things that were polarizing, such as um, violence or um, things that did not promote cross-cultural cross interaction. So for example, you can see here that the top two Palestinian accounts, one of them, the one with the two asterisks, is an account which posts solely information and educational content, as well as peaceful advocacy. And then the first, the most followed uh, Palestinian activist account is actually a Jewish account for Palestine. And while it's important not to equate being Jewish with supporting Israel, um, this account provides a space for a community which largely supports one side to learn about a different side and to facilitate, like I was talking about, cross-cultural interaction. And you see that similarly with um, the Israeli accounts where the second most followed account is one that posts solely information and tends to have less biased information. And I also wanted to point out that a lot of Israeli activist accounts do have um, Arabic populations and Muslim populations. They just did not happen to be um, activist accounts, so they didn't make it into this study. But I also wanted to point out that these numbers are actually changing. So the two um, Palestinian accounts that I was talking about actually now have more followers. And um, for example, the most followed Israeli account, which does not promote solely information is actually losing followers. So you see this trend kind of shifting and kind of proving my point a little bit more. And then with the most viral accounts, you see a very similar thing where people are engaging, well, all of the posts, first of all, are posts which engage in information and also cross-cultural interaction. Like I said, shows right here, six of them with information, four out of the 10 with cross-cultural interaction. And then only two of those incorporate violence, but even the ones that do incorporate violence do incorporate information or peaceful advocacy in some way. And while you can't tell whether it's the violence or the information which made the post go viral, um, you can see by the other ones that the peaceful advocacy slash edu educational content definitely played a role in it going viral. So given that, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the role that activist accounts can play in the future of this conflict, specifically um, in bridging divides, aiding in conflict management and influencing the conflict in general. For the first one, you can see that as I was talking about before with the accounts which facilitate cross-cultural interaction, they can um, bridge divides between groups which largely reject a certain narrative or don't have information on a certain narrative, which in the best case possible can further dialogue between these groups and perhaps create a platform for grassroots peace building, which is a very important part in um, conflict. And then later I talk about conflict management where, as I was talking about before, with educational content and peaceful advocacy, um, this pro proves a um, peaceful and nonviolent alternative for um, advocates and demonstrators. And lastly, as you can see, activists have a very large platform where people want to listen, they want to learn about this stuff. Uh, about the conflict, they're getting their informational content from these accounts. So these accounts have the power and um, the platform to kind of shift these narratives that different people have about this conflict. And like I said, in the best case scenario, it can promote unbiased information and create a common understanding between these groups. So my just me, three main takeaways that I hope you guys get from this is that activist account, unlike what most people think about social media, um, promote much more than just violence and echo chambers and don't just serve to polarize these two sides. And in fact, the content that people were most engaged with actually promoted peaceful advocacy and cross-cultural interaction. And therefore, I think that advocacy accounts can prove a space to facilitate further interact or further understanding in and around the conflict in the future. And while it's important not to just say like, oh, social media can solve everything, especially with the conflict that's been going on for seven years, um, I think that social media, a lot of times we're a little bit too pessimistic. And I think that, I hope that this study shows you that social media can then provide a place for, like I said, um, further understanding. And I think that it can play a really important role in the future of this conflict. So thank you everybody for listening. Thank you very much, Natalia. Okay, so uh, thank you very much presenters.
uh, for your splendid presentations. Uh, let us now uh, open the floor to uh, questioners. So uh, would anyone like to address a question to one or all of our presenters? Oh, yes, Natalia. Sorry, thank you. Um, I have a question for Jake, if that's all right. I, I also just want to say, like I said before, um, everyone did a great job and I was really impressed by all of your uh, presentations. But I have a question specifically, um, you were talking about warm versus cold peace, which I think is a very interesting argument and something that's really important to understand. But have you seen, and you were talking about um, the importance of economic relations in forming warm peace, which I think is also a very valid argument and very important to understand. But how has COVID changed some of the warm peace or the economic relations that Israel has with other Arab countries? Can this help form warm peace or is this going to harm their prospects with warm peace with other Arab nations? Yeah, I, I think that's um, a very important point and thank you for asking. Um, ultimately, you know, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic was a, a driving factor for, for why the Gulf states decided to normalize relations with Israel. Um, you have to keep in mind that um, before COVID, 10% of, of the UAE's uh, GDP was, was tourism. So when you have such a, a large amount of your economy go away like that, um, you know, you're going to look outside of the box and, and try to create solutions for this. And I also want to mention that it's um, important to note that since the Abraham Accords, over 130,000 Israelis have, have visited the United Arab Emirates. And I don't see why this can't be beneficial. Um, you're introducing two different cultures that are more closely related than I think we realize. Um, and, and you're bringing them together, ultimately. You're educating them. I, I've always thought that traveling is the best form of education, um, especially in terms of culturally dealing with different people. So I think that um, economically, the desire for both of these countries to kind of get back on track after the COVID-19 pandemic ultimately opens the doors to several different sectors, such as environment, um, economy, tourism, and, and whatnot. So I think it's beneficial, um, super beneficial for both countries. Thank, Thank you, Jake. Uh, any other questions? Oh, Chloe. My question is also for Jake. Do you think that under the leadership of President Biden, Israel will normalize more ties with Arab countries? Uh, you know, this is actually a concern of mine um, because it's, it's very rare that you see um, an administration come in um, and just say, hey, we're going to support what this administration did. Um, and this is exactly what the Biden administration has done. Um, you know, there's currently a House resolution that's currently in the House of Representatives um, and a resolution in the Senate right now that's receiving uh, fairly bipartisan support over the continuation of normalization of relations between Israel and Arab countries. Um, you know, because I think I think both, both sides um, in terms of American politics can realize that both of these countries are vital assets in the region, are vital allies in the region. Um, and I think that ultimately, you know, it, it will open the doors to future normalization between Israel and other countries. Obviously, uh, the recent violence, you know, set that back a little bit, but um, I don't see why the Biden administration shouldn't push for more Israeli Arab normalization. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Jake. Uh, other questions? Kane. Yes. Uh, my question is just for uh, Supreme. Um, I was just wondering if she thought that the like the Moroccan state anti-Zionism was um, was more performative than like actual like their solid beliefs, given that like the your presentation and your paper showed that they had quite warm relations and that's like for things like um, allowing them to book 
uh, at that conference, for instance, uh, do, do you think that the anti-Zionism anti they espouse is performative for other Arab states so they don't get ostracised from the Arab world like, say, Egypt did when they did their state visit? Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, the internet came off. Can you, like, repeat your question? I'm really sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, do you think, like, um, Moroccan anti-Zionism is more performative on behalf of other Arab countries so that they don't get ostracized from the wider Arab community? Um, that's a really good uh, question. Actually, uh, I had to, to deal with that topic uh, when, when, when researching, actually, uh, this uh, this research paper and indeed I think uh, for instance for Mohammed V um, well I think for Mohammed V he I didn't really touch on it during the presentation but I did uh, on my paper and I explained that like under Mohammed V he really it was more than just performative anti-Zionism okay th maybe there was a part of it but it was a really strong Arab um, co uh, cooperation, and he really thought uh, that what he was doing was for the, the, the Palestinian cause and for the Arab states as a whole. But then under King Hassan II, this changed a lot, and as explained uh, in my presentation, indeed, I think uh, the balance uh, changed, and King Hassan II uh, did a lot of uh, anti Zionism, uh, anti Zionist performative, uh, performative, performative. Methodism. Well, you got the idea. Well, yeah, for sure. Um, and that's what made him such a major mediator in the region. He was able to show off how uh, how wrong the state of Israel was for existing. And on the other hand, uh, for, for his Arab counterparts, and on the other hand, he could, uh, again, uh, tie, like, they, they, they bonded over many, many, uh, many issues. So absolutely. Uh, and last but not least, uh, under King Mohammed VI, I think it's more than just performative uh, anti-Zionism, and, and it's a much different context than uh, it was uh, after 1948. Thanks. Thank you, Kane. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay. Anyways, I had a question. <laughs> sorry. Um, no really sorry. Um, it was for uh, David, I think it is. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I loved your presentation, especially since uh, our topics are kind of, uh, are pretty close. Let's say uh, both uh, uh, analyzing the topomas between two countries, uh, Israel and another country. And I was wondering, uh, as of our, both our presentations, I read your paper and you mentioned quiet diplomacy, which ties our papers together. And I was wondering if uh, you think that, is it better to um, to like, foster under the radar uh, diplomacy in light of mutual uh, in light of the mutual benefits that uh, it can bring to both countries or nowadays in 2021 should transparency prevail in order to look to go forward uh, in the region that is a, a really good question um i i would say that anything is better than nothing so if if quiet diplomacy is the only route that you have that allows you to make progress while still maintaining power and not ending up like, I don't know, like Gaddafi in the streets, then, you know, I mean, that's, that's definitely a step worth taking. Um, I guess in I separating my brain from, from my heart, ideally everything would be transparent and, you know, everybody would know everything, but in, you know, in more of the brain section and the real world, I think that anything is better than nothing. So if, if full transparent cooperation isn't possible, then under the radar is almost as good. Okay, thank you, David. And thank you, Sabrina. Um, Jake, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I had a question for David real quick. Okay. Um, so yours was about uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia is struggles with um, modernization, um, kind of a battle with traditionalism. Um, but MBS is kind of making proactive measures to kind of diversify the economy, modernize the economy away from oil, um, as well as just an overall modernization of Saudi Arabian uh, public. Um, do you think that normalization of relations with Israel and Saudi Arabia you think that Israel could possibly help speed up modernization 
um, in Saudi Arabia? Uh, that, that's also a great question. I think that it would be kind of walking a razor's edge because it's it's already going to be a tough enough sell to the general public um, and especially the hardline portion of the public. Um, normalization will already be a tough enough sell. I think if you added on top of that, the idea that we're taking on these I mean, again, depending where on the spectrum you are, these Zionist ideas or these these wacky Jewish ideas like the some, you know, it, it might do more damage than good if it were applied too quickly or with too many expectations, I guess, would be my answer. Um, if if that makes sense. It, it would it'd be a real a real tricky balance to walk, I guess. And Jake. Uh, any other questions? I I have I have a question. Okay. Uh, I I actually have questions for all of you, but since that feels kind of just too much, uh, my question will be for Natalia. My question is: uh, Did you get to see any kind of statistics in relation to Twitter as opposed to Instagram? Because I for for me personally I'm, I'm more of a twitter person and instagram is like where i go to put stuff maybe about my family and not about politics where twitter is super not that um so i was just wondering if you saw any difference in the the patterns you were seeing on instagram if they were totally the opposite or if they repeated on twitter if that makes sense yeah, no, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, one of the reasons, like I said, why I wanted to focus on Instagram is because I found basically no uh, literature about it. I could find news articles which referenced Instagram or Instagram activist accounts, um, but I couldn't find any literature which talked about um, Instagram's role in conflict and specifically this conflict. Um, so like I said, that's why I wanted to focus on it. I did see a lot on uh, Twitter. I either saw, well, first of all, there's not a lot of uh, literature about the violence that just happened because it's too soon. But um, there was a lot of discourse about and literature about um, Twitter and this conflict in general. And I saw a couple graphs that showed, um, I was gonna include one about like the different echo chambers. And basically that's what the majority of them say is that Twitter serves to polarize or um, it also showed, there was another study that showed um, that Although the sides were polarized, they were saying the same things, but I couldn't find anything on Instagram. And like you, I also think that Instagram is a place where people um, sometimes try and stay out of politics, but I think that these activists are really a special space where people only talk about politics and it served um, to really talk about a certain narrative there. Um, just like you would find on Twitter with activist accounts, but because people, because, I think that Twitter sometimes is a little more, um, I guess, politicized in a, in a sense. I wanted to see the difference that I would find on Instagram. Um, and so that's what I found. So in conclusion, I couldn't find anything on the on Instagram, but I did find a lot on Twitter. I also found a lot about uh, WhatsApp messages, messenger chats, which were interesting. Thank you, Natalia. I'd like to ask a, a related question. Um, at the end of last month, the Israeli daily Haaretz referred to recent anti-Israel uh, activity online among Palestinians as making up a so-called uh, infographic intifada. So I w wanted to ask you if um, infographics were um, more influential or more prevalent uh, during this latest wave of violence than say in 2018 or, or 2014. And also, uh, thank you for the question. I um, thought that infographics played a really important role in the narrative and especially for this conflict. And I also, um, I've seen the thing that you referenced and a lot of other platforms have uh, been referenced as like a third intifada or like a TikTok intifada. Um, I referenced it in my paper. Um, but yeah, I didn't see any rise in infographics. I saw that people were posting perhaps more frequently, but I thought I saw that a lot of the footage was the same actually. That, um, 
a lot of the activist accounts were posting the same things, not as in they were saying the same things, but the same type of posts, um, but they were posting either more frequently or um, they were also posting more, uh, more specifically targeted content or info infographics. But infographics, especially ones that I, I talked about before, which had step-by-step -step processes of how to help, or especially if they were more accessible infographics, for example, just like a clean statement on a page, um, those tended to get a lot more, a lot more supportive engagement. Like I said before, with the educational content, um, those tended to be much more accessible infographics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we're nearing the end. Uh, I'd like to reiterate my gratitude to the uh, panelists. Thank you for your splendid presentations uh, and for applying uh, to participate in the conference in the first place. Um, I hope you'll consider uh, returning next year uh, when the conference, I hope, will uh, be in person as opposed to online. Um, I don't know if that's been decided, but uh, in any case, thank you everyone for your attendance and uh, for the panelists for your participation.